For much of the 20th century, Alexander Hamilton was kind of seen as an authoritarian, championing a strong central government and also an industrial economy. And as Christian Parenti notes, the left has largely favored Hamilton's rival, Thomas Jefferson, a Democrat, of course, a slave owner, whose vision of a less stringent government and export-based agrarian was contrary to Hamilton. Hmm. So not only was Hamilton more progressive for his time, but according to Parenti's new book, Radical Hamilton, Economic Lessons from a Misunderstood Founder, Hamilton was the primary architect of American capitalism and mass industrialization. So Christian Parenti, an associate professor at John Jay College, CUNY, he joins us now to discuss. Christian, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm, I'm a big fan. Awesome. Thank well, you. Christian, I think one of the things that really intrigued me about your book after Crystal mentioned it is this has kind of been a thing on the new ride as well for a long time, kind of reclaiming Hamilton from neoliberalism, which made us made him ascendant with the obviously the Broadway musical. Can you talk about who Hamilton really was in contrast to how he's understood by kind of the cultural elite at this time? Certainly, yeah. The great irony is that Hamilton, while seen as the patron saint of bankers, actually was very committed to using government policy to drive an economic transformation, which in, in his time was away from manufacturing toward, away from agriculture towards manufacturing. And in his much named but rarely read magnum opus, the report on the subject of manufacturers, Hamilton lays out uh, what he calls the means proper, a kind of toolbox of government policy to achieve uh, this economic transformation. This is a protective tariff, government regulations around quality control, uh, um, subsidies for specific firms and sectors, even uh, public ownership of you know 20% of the first bank of the United States, but also the infrastructure, and then some key uh, productive inf uh, installations such as the armory in Springfield, Massachusetts. So these are these you know, very uh, statist interventionist tools that he wanted to use, not just willy-nilly, but in concert with each other as part of an overall plan to drive economic transformation. And his vision, what was going on was he was clear that the U.S. would be recolonized and attacked by many great powers and it had to defend itself by creating a strong government and a strong military. And the only way to do that was to have a wealthy economy. And the only way to have a wealthy economy was to get beyond our dependence on agriculture. And contrary to what Adam Smith argued, which was that you just let the invisible hand of the market take care of these things, Hamilton disagreed. And in the report on manufacturers, he opens with an attack on Smith, where he basically says, you know, free trade, uh, and the invisible hand, that works if you're, if you're already Britain and you're already dominant. But for us, we're going to need government to take a leading role in driving this transformation. And, and the irony of American political economic history, of the irony of American capitalism, is that while Jeffersonian ideology of free trade and states' rights and small government has triumphed, at the policy level, it's really been Hamiltonianism that has built America of uh, government intervention, a kind of government-led mm -hmm. move towards industrialization. And this, this model that, we're, that we use but are in denial around was then a model for many other states that had very successful industrializations, Germany, Japan, et cetera, et cetera, up to yeah. China yeah, today. Yeah, excellent point. Well, I, I want to dig into that. But first, how was that true legacy lost and how were <laughs> neoliberals able to yeah. sort of co-opt him? Well, the, the struggle around this begins immediately. Um, and so there are uh, the, the, the constituency that's opposing this plan at first are the, the Virginian, in particular, slave owners, who, like Thomas Jefferson, who said mm -hmm. that he thought that the Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith was the best book existing. Free trade worked for them. They made a lot of money exporting to Britain and, and uh, primarily Britain and other places. And so they weren't in favor of a strong government. They were also very explicitly afraid that if a strong central state emerged and if it was allowed to drive economic development, that it would then come after their slaves. And Nathaniel Macon of North Carolina, some years after Hamilton died, actually says this to a young congressman who writes to him. He says, why, why are we opposing the federal government building of canals? Don't we want canals down here in the South? And he says, if we allow Congress to build canals, they will no sooner start emancipating our slaves. So essentially, the message was we can't have development 
because if we do, they'll come for our private local prerogatives. So it begins yeah. there, and then it carries on uh, through the ages. And the contradiction is that while this policy works, inevitably a kind of spoiled elites come along who don't want to pay uh, for you know full freight for for what they're benefiting from. So they 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 don't want to be taxed. They don't want the government to invest in the infrastructure or in R and D. And so there's there's an inevitable uh, pushback by the forces of laissez-faire, free market economics. They inevitably win. Their victories produce crises, and then those crises produce a return of the Hamiltonian vision. Mm -hmm. The yeah, first one it, of these cycles is sort of the war, in, of, war of 1812. Yeah, I think it's such an important point. And, and yet, it's like what we keep getting at is the way that you know your average Wall Street person were to know Hamilton would be through the play. And I mean, through the musical. And what does the musical tell us about Alexander Hamilton, which, by the way, has nothing to do with this? I have not seen the musical. Uh, um, okay. My wife well, loves there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, because as I understand it, it, it makes it so it's like he was a champion of immigration or like they don't talk about any of his economic policy. They don't even talk much about kind of his legacy here. And it's, it's really the ultimate irony um, in terms of his understanding. Why is it that we should remember his kind of understanding of the economy today in 2020? I think it's because we need uh, this kind of Hamiltonian policy. Uh, we need a return to it. We've got rising and highly problematic inequality. We've got uh, this pandemic and we've got the problem of anthropogenic climate change. And so, I mean, what dealing with climate change amounts to is essentially a reindustrialization of the country. We've got to get off fossil fuels and build out a clean energy sector. And people, you know, scratching their heads, how do we do this? Do we do it through divestment? How, what do we do? Well, we could do a lot worse than looking at our own economic history and figuring out how we actually industrialized the first time. And how that was achieved was through this sort of Hamiltonian application of the means proper, these government tools of a protective tariff subsidy, guiding it towards a vision uh, through a concerted plan. So I think we need that kind of economic policy to deal with all the problems we face right now. And that a lot of the problems we face right now are actually rooted in the victory of this Jeffersonian, not to knock Jefferson too much, he had a lot of good ideas as well, but this free market ideology, and that this free market ideology is causing uh, problems and does not have solutions to problems like mm -hmm. inequality and how we drive an economic transformation. And finally, Christian, part of why I like your framing here and why I think it's really important is because oftentimes the left likes to point to other countries, like let's do it like Denmark or, you know, let's do it like these other places have done it. I like that you ground it in, no, we have our own tradition here that we can look to. This isn't radical. This isn't different. This isn't, you know, this isn't out of step with American values and our own history. But you do also point to other countries that have implemented this type of industrial policy with great success. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Certainly. So um, other countries imitated us from the beginning. So Germany in particular identified uh, Frederick List comes over to the U.S. Right. Uh, Hamilton dies, and Henry Clay of Kentucky becomes the, the champion of these ideas. And List is very influenced by Clay. List takes these ideas back to Germany. They, what they're at this point called the American system in the U.S. In Germany, they become the national system. And, and this sort of state-led industrialization is what makes Germany a powerful industrial economy. The Japanese imitate the Germans. The South Koreans imitate the Japanese, and the Chinese are now imitating the South Koreans and the Japanese. And in, in East Asia, they actually read the report on manufacturers. So they, they recognize this Hamiltonian tradition as like the, 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 blue, the, the blueprint for the developmental estate. So yeah, the, the things we need are not foreign and alien. They are indigenous to our history and to our culture, and we need to resurrect them and, and take another look at our at our history um, and hopefully you know mm -hmm. uh, this book will help with that well, absolutely point. people should definitely check it out it's called radical hamilton christian pronti thank you so much great to have you thank you christian thank you mm -hmm. the trump campaign has their ads and their fodder ready we're going to tell you about how president trump plans to counter biden's vp pick that's when rising continues